Welcome to NTN Nightly. I am General Novel. This edition's top stories. Government moves to protect the gains made in the battle against COVID-19. Exploring the Love St. Lucia campaign and possibilities for economic growth. And mapping the management of marine resources. The government of St. Lucia has adjusted measures aimed at combating the COVID-19 pandemic. This comes as the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sharon Belmar George, reported a reduction in the transmission rate over the past week, along with reductions in the hospitalization, positivity, and prevalence rates. The daily infection rate for the past week was 22.1 per 100,000 per day, representing a 68% decrease from the previous week. In an update to the nation, Prime Minister the Honorable Philip J. Pierre noted that restrictions imposed over the past month were instrumental in resolving the fourth wave of the virus. These restrictions come with great personal challenges as we strive to find the right balance between securing some level of normality in our daily lives and fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 virus looks like it will be with us for the foreseeable future and we must therefore commence the process of living with that reality while taking the necessary measures to avoid a dysfunctional society. Government has revoked the state of emergency and will manage the pandemic under the COVID-19 Control and Prevention Act. I empathize with you as you continue to live with the many inconveniences brought on by this global COVID-19 virus. I believe that the majority of the illusions have done well in observing the protocols. And I want to thank you for your endurance. We cannot give up. We must keep observing the protocols and keep calling on each other to do the same. The battle we are fighting requires a collective effort on the part of everyone. This is not a government problem. It's a country problem and requires the input of all citizens. I am entrusting every citizen to do the right thing by observing the protocols and the measures that the government has been advised to put in place by the medical professionals to win this COVID-19 battle. Health Minister Honorable Moses Jabati says while there has been an overall reduction in the transmission rate, the country is still at a critical phase and the public cannot let its guard down. To ensure the gains made are not reversed, Minister Jabatis announced that on weekends, there will be confinement to residents. Monday to Friday, confinement begins from 7 p.m. and ends at 4 a.m. Saturday, confinement starts at 7 p.m. and ends on Monday at 4 a.m. However, government has made provision for worship on Sundays. A person may attend a religious ceremony on Sundays during confinement but must return to his or her residence by 1 p.m. on that day. In other words, you can attend services on Sunday, but must return home by 1 p.m. Three, a person shall not host or attend a mass crowd event, a social event, except with 10 or less persons of his or her immediate family or household. Four, religious ceremonies are allowed based on the square footage of the organization in keeping with approved COVID-19 response plan. Special religious rites, including weddings, baptisms, and funerals are permitted with 50 or less persons. Five, suspension of the sale and disposal of intoxicating liquor at bars, rum shops and grab and go restaurants. The Prime Minister has indicated that all of these establishments will be supported with an economic package very soon. Six, the sale and disposal of intoxicating liquor from a supermarket, gas station or wholesaler and approved dine-in service restaurants with a valid liquor license will be permitted. Seven, dine-in services at approved restaurants and food establishments only, takeaway, grab-and-go, and delivery services 
will be permitted at other establishments. The extended protocols come into effect Saturday, October 16, 2021 and end on Thursday, October 30, 2021. The National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, would like to notify the general public of changes that will be instituted to facilitate movement of motor vehicles during confinement hours by virtue of COVID-19 prevention and control, physical distancing number 15 order. St. Lucia Statutory Instrument 2021 number 164, effective October 17, 2021, curfew passes which were issued by NEMO shall no longer be valid and will be replaced with a vehicle authorization pass. This new pass will be issued in the following categories. Orange vehicle authorization pass, which expires on December 31, 2021. White vehicle authorization pass, which expires on November 16, 2021. And or a letter of authorization pass issued for a period not exceeding two weeks. Individuals who qualify for authorization passes must submit their request via email to admin at nemo.gov.lc. A transitional period from October 17 until October 22, 2021, has been agreed with the police to facilitate the process of replacing the outgoing curfew passes with a new vehicle authorization pass. The Love St. Lucia campaign designed to increase consumption of local products and services continues to be supported by private sector stakeholders. Massey Stores, through its local supplier visibility campaign, has been an ally of Love St. Lucia. Since June, Massey Stores has been featuring various entrepreneurs and their products. Thus far, this campaign has helped to support the growth of many small manufacturers, many of whom initially had no experience in delivering goods to the supermarket chain. More in this specially produced feature. By supporting small local manufacturers who supply their stores, Massey Stores is helping to ensure that good quality local products can continue being produced. The owners of Kako Setlisi and Yanis Custom Cakes both tell a powerful story about their product's journey with the supermarket retail company. The relationship we have with Massey Stores is very good. The staff Anna, Kim, Shala, Krishna are very helpful and supportive. I remember the day that we brought in our products, which is the pizza crust. When I brought this pizza crust to them, oh, when they tasted a day or two after, we had absolutely no problem. They said they would take it in. So was the cakes. And when I go to the stores and ask, how is the product doing? Oh, they say it's great. So the encouragement with Massey is very, very supportive. Yanis Custom Cakes was the brainchild of Yannicka Henville, a young lady with a passion for baking and cake design. After moving overseas, the family, her sister, mother and father decided to continue in her stead, operating from a small outdoor kitchen a few yards away from home. While the ladies focus on the recipes and cooking, the father takes care of the deliveries and purchasing. Together, they produce fruitcakes, flavored pizza crusts, mini and bite-sized pizzas, tamarind balls, a combination of herbs and spices, and even charcoal. I can't believe what we started at home in the kitchen is now at the master stores. My daughter left her business with us and she's really proud of us as to starting with cakes and we're moving into other products, which is the pizza shell. She said, Mommy, Mommy, I'm so proud of you all. You all are doing, you all are doing so much more than what I never thought I would have done with it. I am really proud of you all doing that. Seeing our name out there, our little family business we started, it's really good. Kako Setlisi was founded by husband and wife duo Callistus and Maria Jackson, who operate a truly indigenous artisan chocolate company. From humble beginnings, starting off in a retrofit garage in 2015, the company has grown significantly, recently opening the doors of their new chic location in Canneries with a complement of five full-time staff. 
Kako Setlisi offers a variety of milk and dark chocolates. Tasting and production tours complement their offerings to locals and tourists who also get the opportunity to try their hands at custom making their very own chocolate bar. Massey stores carry most of the line of chocolate we produce. They, they, they carry the 70 percent, 70 percent with cashew island spice and milk chocolate and milk with cashew. They, so we basically buy the beans from the farmers, ferment it ourselves and then dry it and then do the grinding with, I mean, limited machinery for the, cho the chocolate. The, cho the, the product is a premium product. We are very grateful for Massey stores because um, during COVID, Massey was the only one giving us a check. And it's amazing that sometimes Massey would call us and tell us they are staff, they are guests, um, customers lined out, waiting for the, for the chocolate. It's like, wow. As this season of the Massey Local Supplier Visibility Campaign comes to a close, the 10 entrepreneurs featured thus far highlight the power of the relationship in helping them cope with the current challenging situation in creating a space to strengthen their production and making a difference in their businesses as a whole. For their part, the team at Massey Stores are now looking ahead to determine who will be featured in Season 2. Meanwhile, St. Lucia continues to explore various avenues in an effort to achieve economic sustainability and development. Conscious of this endeavor, the National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, NCPC, thought it prudent to explore the topic, the Love St. Lucia campaign, the possibilities for economic growth and job creation. The campaign implemented by the Ministry of Commerce aims to build resilience in the St. Lucian economy by encouraging hobby farming, maximizing the potential of local industry, improving consumer awareness, and increasing domestic market share of local manufacturers and service providers. Trade advisor and consultant Dr. Thomas Samuel highlighted that external shocks have forced countries the world over to reduce external dependencies. He explained the impact of the Love St. Lucia campaign. Money spent or purchasing or um, spent on small firms or local industries has a greater multiplier effect or local premium, to, to call it that, in terms of stimulating downstream e effects because of recirculation of the, the, the income that is generated. One of the advantages of, of doing that is you have what we call less leakages. And when you have less leakages from the circulation of income, you have a higher uh, net impact on, on the local economy. So that makes a compelling case. Most of the persons that are involved in um, producing, uh, uh, that would be the target audience that we're talking about, are people that are essentially connected. They are from the community, so they have a vested interest. And so there's, there's that sort of stability, that's, that uh, I feel like commitment, I think is a good word, um, to the development of the, 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 the community and the country. So you know that this is not uh, money that's just going to be repatriated or these people have a footloose relationship and they will disappear in the short term. So there are a lot of arguments around the world and a number of countries have been now uh, revisiting that as we see what we call, some say, a resurgence of nationalism. The campaign is geared towards promoting national pride and increasing local consumption of local products and services. Executive Director of the St. Lucia Manufacturers Association, Paula James, highlighted the role of the association in the success of the campaign. The Executive Director also sought to debunk the myth that if it's locally produced, then it is of a lesser quality. Everything we do is supposed to be local and to produce, first of all, to be used locally. And um, sometimes you have the myth, because it's local, it's not good. I would like to let you know that every one of our processors and manufacturers must follow standards, must. We have at least over 5,000 persons employed within the sector, and that does not filter into our farmers, because about 70% of our manufacturers have to use local farmers. It's a must. We work with them to make sure we can produce a product. Then you have those who can literally build a house for you from the roof right down 
to the yard. Everything that you require to build a house is manufactured locally. Economists in the Corporate Planning Unit of the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security and Rural Development, Carling Joseph, indicated that the ministry has been supporting the Buy Local campaign with a number of projects including the Seven Crops project. The project is being embarked upon in collaboration with the Taiwan Technical Mission and seeks to reduce St. Lucia's food import bill by enhancing the efficiency of production and distribution supply chains in St. Lucia's fruits and vegetable sector. And we've noticed uh, increases in cases of non-communicable diseases in St. Lucia, diabetes, hypertension, and the agricultural sector you know, has been coming up with a number of initiatives to address these, these non-communicable non diseases by encouraging even our consumers to buy local. Instead of all those processed commodities, you know, we are working together to ensure that the cost of local agricultural produce is affordable. We know that farmers are being challenged with the high cost of inputs there's also climate change, which has affected agricultural produ production, continues to affect agricultural production. You know, we have had many incidences of droughts, excessive rainfall, and this presents challenges to farmers in St. Lucia. So we have been working with donor agencies to provide the necessary support to farmers to enable them to produce under these changing climatic conditions. You know, we have been working with donor agencies to provide support in terms of greenhouses to increase agricultural production. The discussion is one in a series of panel discussions being held by the NCPC as part of its observance of Productivity Awareness Week. From the Government Information Service, I am Janelle Novell. As part of its ongoing efforts to better manage St. Lucia's natural resources, the Department of Fisheries collaborated with sector agencies to conduct a mapping exercise of the Canaries Ancillary and Soufre Marine Management areas. The Soufre Marine Management Association in the year 2000 was gazetted as the local fisheries management agency designated to manage the Soufre Marine Management area. In order to improve their capacity, the Department of Fisheries and the Soufre Marine Management Association have joined forces to map out the boundaries of the marine reserves, zones and other areas within the Canaries Ancillary Marine Management Area and the Soufre Marine Management Area. According to Chief Fisheries Officer Sarita Williams-Peter, the initiative is a critical component in ensuring the effective and efficient management of fisheries as the agencies will be better equipped to avoid and resolve conflict between resource users in the area while also protecting marine life. The department recognizes that over the years, since it's gazetted in the year 2000, what has happened is that there was a lot of institutional memory lost, of course, in terms of the zones. There are yacht mooring areas, there are recreational areas, there are marine reserves and there are fishing priority areas and all of these areas have particular types of rules and regulations governing what can happen in those areas. Now very critical to that is people need to know where those boundaries are and what has happened is that we have relied more or less on uh, institutional memory, uh, landmarks to be able to indicate that. But as we move towards enforcing those areas better and to have a long history or catalog of it, it's critical that we what we call delimit these areas properly with georeference points. The mapping exercise was supported by Nature Conservancy, a global environmental non-profit organization with the mission of conserving land and waters around the world. Nature Conservancy researcher Steve Chill explains the importance of the mapping exercise in enforcing the fishing laws. It's very difficult to enforce uh, a, a management area if you don't know where the boundaries exactly are. And so my job is to come here and help identify those boundaries. We're using a transducer which we attach to the side of the boat. We're trying to find that 75 meter contour or depth and we're following that, mapping that out, because that marks the seaward boundary of the management zone. And then we're also trying to find the coordinates where each of the zones begin and start, such as where the yachts uh, are mooring, where their fishing priority areas, 
uh, where there are recreational areas and where there are marine reserves. So we're mapping those out and trying to get very precise measurements so that that can be given to the government and we have an official gazette of where the marine zones are. The two-day management area mapping exercise began on Tuesday, October 12, 2021 and concluded on Wednesday, October 13, 2021. From the Communications Unit of the Ministry of Agriculture, I am Anicia Antoine reporting. This is NTN Nightly. Please stay with us. The Department of Finance has introduced the Electronic Government Procurement System, EGP. The EGP system has many benefits for stakeholders involved in government procurement. The government seeks to adopt a strategic approach to its purchasing process. Electronic government procurement improves efficiency of procurement and enhances data capture. The EGP is innovative and will automate the sequence from notification, receiving and evaluation of submissions to final contract award. It improves communication between vendors and government agencies, provides greater transparency and builds confidence in the vendor community through increased access to information. To participate, vendors, suppliers and contractors must register on the electronic government procurement platform. EGP, improving efficiency and transparency in the acquisition of goods, works and services. Welcome back. The St. Lucia Cadet Corps, a non-profit paramilitary organization which seeks to inspire young people to achieve success in life with a spirit of service to their local community and country, continues to lead by example. Over the past few Sundays during the 24-hour curfew due to COVID-19 measures, members of the 3rd Battalion of the organization have been going to various communities to feed the needy. Major Dylan St. Jules explains how the initiative came about. The, the St. Lucia Cadet Corps by itself is, is a non-profit um, community service organization. Um, specifically, um, the, the organization is used to, to develop young persons into leaders. The idea behind the, the St. Lucia Cadet Corps is developing young um, secondary school students into leaders. And and with a strong concept of community service. And I can tell you over the years, the Cadet Corps has, has been serving St. Lucia, especially around disaster time. And, and, and mainly our disaster experience in St. Lucia is mainly the hurricane season. And these um, cadets give it their all. When everybody are warm in the beds during, during the hurricane, sometimes we come out before because we usually get a warning. A small group will come out to Nemo headquarters and await the outcome. And if necessary, other cadet officers come out and we do all kinds of servicing within the, within the community. Um, we have a, a lot of history of service to, to St. Lucia, especially through, through, through these disasters. The St. Lucia Cadet Corps in 2020, when the island faced its first lockdown, was also at the forefront of the national initiative to feed the homeless. The organization is well known for its humanitarian service over the years and St. Jules says that they will continue to build on this foundation of serving the community. We are happy to be here today as part of an initiative which was conceptualized by one of the members of, of this group, the St. Lucia Cadet Corps, um, in the name of Captain Elizy. Um, um, one evening while we were having a, a battalion chat, um, Elise suggested that, uh, you know, because of, of all the protocols which has put in place be, to try to control this COVID-19 pandemic, um, we, 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 we had this, this, this lockdown Sunday. It started as a lockdown Sunday. The idea started by we trying to, to think about the vagrants who were probably, you know, on the streets and would not be able to, to, to get a meal. So we, we really partnered with a few of, of, of other persons. So the St. Lucia Cadet Corps was, was able to network with the Ministry of Equity and, and exchange some ideas and some social partners. And we were able to come up with some healthy meals from, from the, the first um, implementation of the Lockdown Sunday. 
So when this initiative started, we were able to do the Grosile area, Grand Rivière, um, Barouange, Marshy, that general area, Grosile. So we took the, 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 that idea to ancillary canneries, and this, is, this will be the fourth um, sun, Sunday that we are trying to bring some, some sort of relief to the less fortunate. Um, so the members of the St. Lucia Cadet Corps, the Ministry of, of Equity, NEMO, and, and some social partners, even including members, uh, officers within the organization contributed personally so that we can make the project come alive. The, this project has been, been ongoing and we have been getting social partners come in and assist us to do this because you have to understand that the St. Lucia Cadet Corps is, is a, is a, is a non-money making organization and we just seek support. So we are thankful of the BAT for especially Ministry of Equity for providing their resources and the other social partners um, in the community, corporate St. Lucia. Um, in the same time that I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning that, I, I'm asking anybody who is interested in supporting that cause could come contact the St. Lucia Cadet Corps through their Facebook page and then we could, could do even more, more for the, the needy persons within the community. The, the food is being prepared by the, the, the officers within the St. Lucia Cadet Corps. We have trained guys who come in, sometimes they prep overnight, they would come out just to do the prepping, and the, the, the Sunday they, they do the actual cooking so that the meals can be delivered fresh and hot to, to these needy persons within the community. Major Dylan St. Jules of the 3rd Battalion of the St. Lucia Cadet Corps. We now take a look at the weather. Forecast for St. Lucia valid for the next 24 hours. Fair skies becoming cloudy at times with a few scattered showers. Seas light to moderate with waves 3 to 5 feet or 0 0.9 to 1.5 meters. Light to moderate southeasterly winds will continue across the Lesser Antilles during the forecast period. A trough system located just west of the Leeward Islands will continue to cause cloudiness, showers and possibly isolated thunderstorms over these islands during the forecast period. Two other tropical waves located over the central and eastern tropical Atlantic are moving westward near 15 miles per hour or 24 kilometers per hour. That brings us to the end of NTN Nightly. Join us next time at 7 p.m. with a repeat at 7 a.m. You can also catch up with us anytime on the St. Lucia Government Facebook page or YouTube channel. I am Janelle Norville.